uh, this the uh, trouble with females that exist for a while. May I have the next, please? On the other hand, you know, when you get later, he, he does women from back view, see is what he develops first. Loves the actions of the scapular, the twist, the, the contraposter when a battle lifts, a body lifts an arm, and he does the most beautiful behinds. <laughs> this, and I'm drawn to show you this too because it's a sketch. It's not the finished picture of Bathsheba taking her bath while King David, biblical story, sees her uh, from his uh, rooftop and, and falls in lust with her, in love with her. She sees him. She knows that this is a bad sign. He sends her a messenger make, asking for an assignation, and you don't turn that down with the king, although she's, she's married and loves her, king, her husband very much. So already a sense of happiness has gotten into her body. It's a sketch. It's large, as large as the finished picture. And the sketch is very finished, but I'll notice that Jerome is pretty good at a loose brush stroke, too. The type brush stroke that we think is academic is never discussed in any of the theory books of the time. It was just assumed that you would bring the finish to what you wanted it to be. And they never talk about skill in those textbooks. It was just assumed that before you tackled something like this, you had your skills in your back pocket. But I remember most about this picture, other than the fact that the Bathsheba becomes even more beautiful and, and erotic, that in this gutter here between the two buildings, there's a great planting of red geraniums, really bright red geraniums, just governing everything. But I wanted to show you what, how developed his oil sketches would be before he uh, probably scared, squared them off and transferred them to a canvas or what. He, he would say when he sat down to paint, he knew what he, exactly what he was going to do. Let's have the next, please. Now here we are again in the height in the 70s, late 60s and 70s when he was painting one great work after the other. John Spyhart always thinks this is his masterpiece and thinks this is when he got everything together in the great Polique Verso. Seen as, in, of course, in the Colosseum. It's in the fourth century with a very insignificant uh, emperor in his box. And the two men who've been uh, placed against, uh, fought against each other, probably with maybe about 10 other pairs in the Colosseum at the time, one would have a sword, a long sword, or short sword, and a shield. The other would have a net and a triton. And the man with the triton is evidently le uh, losing. The man who's winning is not a young Steve Reeves type. He's an older man, sagging breasts. He's been killing people off in the, uh, in the, uh, in the gladiator fights for years, probably. He's dressed in very expensive armor gold helmet, expensive greaves, uh, and he's waiting for the crowd or for the emperor to, to decide whether the man who's lost or lost the battle should be dispatched with a sword to his neck or whether he should be allowed to go free. And the sign supposedly is thumbs up or thumbs down. We don't know what polike verso means. It means turn the thumbs. We know that in last judgments in, in the West, in, in, in Europe, Christ holds his thumb up for those who are saved and down for those who are condemned. And we know that in, in the East, in the Orthodox Church, the, the lost judgments are just the opposite. So anyway, Jerome decided this with this picture. Now notice how the light is handled. We're in the Colosseum, which had canvas strips over it to, to shade at least the royal box and the important people. And those strips on the floor of light coming down the walls are through the cracks or these empty spaces between the strips. There's a bright light up in the background with the crowd and the walls of the Colosseum. Those lights come down and come onto the principal group, which really stands out. And something that is quite amazing to me in this picture, every time I see it, there's a lot of gold in it. The gladiator who's standing has gold in it, and a wonderful male uh, sleeve that is silver gold and the man lying down has a silver around his neck and another I mean gold and a gold helmet but they're just toned right in values so that they don't detract from the main from the main gladiator's uh, helmet and um, but still they center the group down send an answer to the gold walls to the gold strips on the wall 
of this young man, the, the man with the, tri, uh, with the net, has, his net has caught on the buckle of the tall gladiator, and he has backed him up, thrusting out his sword at him till he trips over someone dead from another battle. All pretty juicy, and you'll notice that the Vestal Virgins, as they are, and the writer all saying thumbs down. The Emperor's waiting, so he doesn't want to make a decision that is against the crowd. The, the pictures, everything is painted well in it, and the color schemes are wonderful, with reds leading across, and uh, bright light echoing down, and yet uh, everything is occurring in shadow. And it's, of course, the most famous picture book when I was a kid that was still in Latin grammars. So this is Jerome at, at his best. May I have another one, please? And I want to show you something else now. That you continually say, uh, oh, the, one of the calumnies against Jerome was that he painted for photogravure reproduction. I want to show you how much duller the picture are, are without color. And it's a very good picture. It's in the exhibition. But he must have known that his color was a, one of the great attributes that he had. And he must have picked out for reproduction only those with strong drawing that could be read and, and understood without coloring. But he obviously valued his color very much. Because when you see this picture, it's a slave market. Or it's, it's just called for sale. There's on a street uh, with uh, some women lined up and the monkeys in with them somewhere, I can't quite see it, to show that, uh, and they're just for sale, very casually. You know, this is, doesn't mean that he saw such a scene, um, but some of you, some of you, this a footnote, may have been at the so-called colloquium at the Getty last week in which the people talked about or, uh, Jerome's Orientalism, or, or Orientalizing, saying that it was always critical of, of the Orient and putting it in a bad space and also very stressing the sensual and the sexual. There's a famous picture they talked about at some length with a, a, a prospective buyer putting his hand in the teeth of a naked slave in the mouth just to, taste, to see if her teeth were good. No one would sympathize or empathize, no Westerner would empathize with a man doing something that cruel. And they didn't see that that picture and this picture are not so much titillating, They're, they are abolitionist pictures, painted right at the height of the new abolitionist movement in, in Europe from, from in America from 1830 to 1881 when un, one country after another abolished slavery. And he's just showing that the degrading quality. The slaves are all nicely characterized. Each one is different. And above the shopkeeper you can't see is a wonderful uh, colored parrot. But when you see the picture, it's absolutely unified by the light reflecting on the front and by the light in the street, which you could hardly see, or very bright, direct sunlight, setting up a strong tone, and it's absolutely flawless in its transition from light to dark and as it comes through the room and hits the edge. It's just a remarkable picture. And um, you see that the, the photogravures and photos are not, so I don't, don't tell you what he's about. So I have some excuse for my early over interest in drawing. And then look at women and uh, his, he, the, how he painted women. This is an early portrait. Every artist has to draw portraits at a time in his life, usually in his youth, until he gets bigger commissions. It's a very interesting portrait. It's, a making, it's imitating a pose of Ang, the great portrait painter of the time. It was, it's of an artist, a, a, an artiste, an actress, whom Jerome went to and begged her to, uh, to let him do a portrait. I'll get it in the salon, it'll make you famous, and it'll just cost $2,000. He borrowed all the props, I mean, the, the scarf and the rose, uh, the wreath of, ro of false roses in her hair, and the dress, took them home, sketched her quite thoroughly, and when he sent it back, she didn't want to pay for it. She said, it doesn't look like me. He went to court. The judge just said, bring in the, the painting and put it next to the girl and said, no resemblance. <laughs> Take it back. So Jerome had it in his studio for the rest of his life. Oh. <laughs> now, may I have the next slide, please. Now, he's interested in men because they're bony, they're muscular, 
the, the, the structure throws to the body, the faces are strong and, and with strong uh, shadow markings in them and, and bone structure. And but of course, that's what he studied in the academy. They would scratch, sketch from a, a naked model, a male model, and must have still in, in, in French and Italian, model is masculine, even when it's for a female. And the models became sort of female in the, sometime in the 20th century, it became the most popular model. But everyone worked for males. And look how at least interested in, in how he stands, the feet are spray, he has to get the balance uh, correct for that. He makes sure that you see the anatomy of the shoulders and, and the arms coming through the sculpture. He has this Arno skirt, as it's called, it's a Greek skirt. He loves to paint it and all the values of the of least in it. The man is a keeper of hounds. Um, you know that that Islam does not look favorably upon dogs, they're unclean. The one exception that you can have as a dog is a whippet, a hunting dog. And the whippet dog, of course, would be kept by a slave, and I don't think it helped his position much either that he had dogs, but they were the keeper of the hounds. And, there's, and this is a tiny picture. There are many of these because Jerome could paint them at home with his uh, with models. Uh, with if he traveled, he was in London during the war, Prussia, Franco-Prussian War. He could get models, and he knew all these costumes by heart and props, and he could paint them, paint them, and make money. And they're they're all very very fine. And you can see how this light from the sun hits down below. It skips over over the white Arno cuts and then hits the the bent part of the tent. It is there in the skirt, but you don't see it so strong. And the horse, the, the whippet looks very good. It looks very yellowish instead of brown. They have the next piece. Now think of that model we've just seen. And here he is painting a friend of his. No, oh, he really likes them. He glorifies them. Puts them in an informal pose. And it's rather small as informal po portraits are supposed to be. And look what he can see in a man's face. And look, we can tell the difference it can make between a fat and hanging fat on the chin, a, a different light, the strong light on the cartilage of the nose. He's really good at painting men, but of course, as I say, he not only did this for three years in school, but he ta taught it by this time 20 years when he was a professor. <laughs>